Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bios and Bookmarks, powered by the NGC Bocas Litfest. My name is Shivani Ramlochan, and I am especially delighted to be speaking today with Monique Rafi. Monique, welcome to Bios and Bookmarks. Thank you so much, Shivani. I'm very, very happy to be here, um, mostly because I get to talk to you <laughs> for the next hour, somebody I admire greatly. So thank you for having me. I mean, thank you so much for agreeing to this time, Monique. And what is an extraordinarily and excitingly busy time for you? For those of you just joining us, Monique, Monique's new book, The Mermaid of Black Conk, published by People Tree Press, has, as many of you may know, but some of you may not, been awarded the Costa Book of the Year Award. And it has shot this book, which was, I want to stress, already remarkable <clears throat> on its pre-award into a much deserved global spotlight. I mean, The Mermaid of Black Honk is a dark romance which has its reaches in some of our most ancient and folkloric rituals. It is about love, pain, sacrifice, and there is magic and crime mixed into there. Very fitting since theme of this season is crime and wonderment in which we're exploring books by Caribbean writers about criminality and also the wildly and wondrously speculative. So I think without further ado, I will invite Monique to read for us from The Mermaid of Black Ong. Monique, over okay. to you. Okay, I'm going to read a little bit um, from the beginning of the book when um, some American fishermen have arrived looking to, you know, they're all boats coming from down the islands, from Colombia, from Miami, from the other islands. They're all arriving in Black Cog to um, see if they could catch marlin. This is happening in the 70s. They're all looking for big fish to catch. And um, so two American men have come down from Miami on their boat and um, they've hired some local crew, uh, nicer country and short leg and Nicholas, and they're out um, in blue open water. And um, they've been, they've been, uh, they've hooked, hooked something and they've been hanging on to this fish for some time. And I'm just gonna start reading from when this fish leaps from the water. That thing's about to come up, shouted the father. Son of a goddamn bitch is coming up. Keep your rod up. The flat dark sea broke open and the mermaid rose up and out of the water, her hair flying like a nest of cables, her arms flung backwards in the jump, her body glistening with scales and her tail flailing, huge and muscular like that of a creature from the deepest part of the ocean. She beat up and out, arcing through the air, so she flipped on her back. The men saw her head, her breasts, her belly, the pubic bone of a woman where it met the tail of a glistening fish. Jesus Christ, exclaimed Thomas Clayson. Nicer crossed himself. The black conch men gasped. Cut the line, shouted nicer country. Cut the goddamn line. All five men were horrified as she hit the water thrashing. Her mouth was bloody and she'd only just started to fight. On the end of Hank Clayson's rod was a wild creature, furious to be so caught. Nicer knew they'd caught something they shouldn't have. He jumped down from the flight bridge with his knife. The mermaid, or whatever it was, deserved to stay in the sea. This wasn't his business at all. The thing looked too big for the boat. It could even take the boat down. Don't do that, shouted Thomas Clayson as Nysa bent to cut the line. Do not do that. She's worth millions. Millions! And we're bringing her in. God damn it, we are bringing her in. She was on the surface now, thrashing like a mako shark, fighting the line with her arms coughing up blood and spitting and screaming her high wailing song. Oh God, stammered Hank. Did you see that? His hands were shaking with the rod. The father wanted to take it from him. 
The black conch men, Nicholas short leg backed away from the stern. Like nicer, they knew this was wrong. They frayed bad jumbie fish get catch. They didn't want to help. They were lost for words for what to do. The white men wanted to pull this creature out of the sea, but this fish was half woman, plain enough. Everyone had heard of the mermen of black conch waters, but a merwoman, nah. She carried with her bad luck at best and her hair had frightened them like she could kill with just one lash from those tentacles. She could poison them all. They'd seen spikes on her back, dorsal spikes, scorpion fish spikes. They had seen a bloody raging woman on the end of the fishing line. And now these white men wanted to bring her in? Nah, boy, they all said to themselves. The mermaid was now under the surface again. And the younger Clayson's face was full of terror and excitement. Hold her, shouted the father. What do you think it looks like I'm doing? The son snapped. Keep backing onto it, Thomas Clayson shouted to Nysa. Nysa had begun to see dollar signs. If it had been him alone, he would have thrown her back in the sea. But the talk made him realise that this could make him enough money for another boat or even a new car or even a new business of his own. Imagine that. He threw the throttle into reverse and slowed the boat down. The engine hummed. Nysa could feel his own curiosity grow. How much could she fetch? He backed the boat slowly onto the fish. The line had stopped going out. The younger Clayson was lifting and lowering his rod and lifting and lowering and the line was now coming back onto the reel as fast as he could turn the reel handle. The mermaid had gone back under for now. That thing must weigh, what, 600 pounds, said Thomas Clayson. The ocean was flat and empty again. There was silence apart from the sound of the reel ticking over. Did you see her, said Hank Clayson. Hell yes, said the father. Did you see her tits, said the son. He was so entranced by what he'd caught, it loosened his tongue. Hell yes, said the father. Did you see her face? Yes. Did you see her arms? Yes. Did you see her pussy bone? All the men nodded at this. We could sell her to the Smithsonian, said Thomas Clayson, or the Rockefeller Institute for research. The line was slowly coming in and for the next 20 minutes, the men stared hard astern, each calculating what might happen if they caught her and each feeling a deep, boiling up sensation in his groin. They didn't know what to expect. And they kept their eyes on the sea and listened to the real ticking. She was coming in, but she would fight again. Be careful we don't end up over her, said Thomas Clayson. Nice and knew this could happen. He ran for the engine again. Tighten on her a little, said the father. Hank Clayson had been holding the rod and the weight of the mermaid for almost two hours and his whole body was aflame with the strain of it. The line started to go out again. Let the motor idle. Nice to stop the engine. Then the boat started to move backwards. Hank Clayson was reeling her in, but the shorter the line got, the more she pulled back. And then there was a creaking sound somewhere in the boat's hull. She was pulling back on the line and she must weigh the same as another small boat. She got under the hull. She could take the boat down. Minutes ticked past. The ocean was quiet, metallic blue. Take only what you need, it whispered. Shit, said Thomas Clayson. She's under the boat. They waited and watched slowly. A large shadow passed beneath them, something big. One flip of its back and they could be pitched upwards into the air. Thomas Clayson unstrapped himself from his harness and stood up and peered down and whistled, and the sea broke open again. This time she jumped port side. This time she was more fish than woman and her power was clear. She leapt high and wide of the boat, her tail gleaming like yards and yards of silver ribbon. Up she breached and her mass of clotted dreads flew and her bloodied mouth was twisting with the line. She came down heavily in the water, causing a mighty wake slapping the water with her tail. The boat fell a good two inches port side. 
She swam hard and took the boat with her. The Black Conch men were shouting to cut the line. Thomas Clayson panicked too, for to rev the engine against her would mean to snap the line and lose her. The mermaid dove deep and the boat tipped and the men all fell on top of each other, except for Hank who was harnessed into the chair. Fight her, shouted the father, bring that bitch in. The boat lurched again and then it rolled as if its very belly had been tugged, as if the mermaid might be able to tug away the flight deck or the aft deck, as if she might be able to pull the boat apart. The reel zizzed. Hank Clayson's rod was bent into the sea. It was clear he couldn't hold it. He was too tired and his will had flagged. He was frightened now of what he'd seen. The boat was moving backwards and it was listing badly. They were far out to sea, no sight of land. Father grabbed the rod from his son and he began to show his skill as a fisherman. He had caught big fish before, he wasn't frightened. He knew there was an hour or two to come. They'd only just started with the struggle. The mermaid would tie, it was tired, but she was also strong. Get me a drink, said, to said Thomas Clayson. To nobody in particular, there's a flask of rum in the satchel, bring it to me. Nysa began to see the course of events. Man against catch to the bitter end. Man against creature and the creature was half woman. The old white man, men exchanged seats with his son and strapped himself into the harness. Short leg brought him his flask of rum. The boat belonged to this man. He'd come to show his sissy ass son how to fish. Now he'd stepped in. Rev the engine just a touch, he said to Nysa. I think I'm just going to stop there. It goes on. Hi. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I was sitting here riveted as if I were involved in, in this primordial tussle. Thank you so much for that reading, Monique. And I want to begin our conversation by thinking about the history of this particular mermaid. May anyone mm. who's, who's been fortunate to know the arc of your writing will know that the idea of writing about a mermaid's journey, a mermaid's romance, and a mermaid's struggle is not new. So I'm really curious about how the journey of Aikaya has changed and evolved from its first incarnation in your imagination to what we see on the page now. Mm. Well, I mean, it's going to sound corny, but it's true. Um, she began, I began to dream, dream of her. I, I, a mermaid began to infest my dreams. I would spend lots of time um, in Grand Riviere and in Tobago and by the sea. And there would be people fishing and bringing in big fish and hanging fish and then competitions and just over years, not something that happened quickly. And um, I began to have these dreams of a lynched mermaid hung by her tail. So the, my mermaid was just, you know, humanity has been dreaming up mermaids for thousands of years. So I had my, um, the universal came to me to the, to the specific. And then um, I don't remember when, but I stumbled across the legend of Aikaia. And I was like, yeah, right, okay. That story needs a rewrite. Um, many of our myths are embedded in an ancient patriarchy. And this is one of them. Um, and it's a story of women cursing. Um, it's sort of um, a young, pretty, talented, beautiful woman being cursed by uh, married, married women. And not only do they curse the young, pretty, beautiful woman, but an old crone as well, a hag. <coughs> and it says so much about how difficult it is to be a woman and to get being a woman right. And then they, they, they banish her, they exile her um, forever. And I mean, the minute I stumbled across this, I mean, it, it may even have been something I found when I was trawling around online, I can't even remember. This, this, this legend I stumbled across is very slim. It's like you miss it. It's not like I found it in a book or something. I've, 
it's quite a hard, I mean, I've come across it again and again in different permutations. So it does live somewhere in the uh, Taino um, pantheon of, of, of stories. But um, there was so much there for me to, to work with. And all of a sudden, my own dreams and an ancient legend, they just found each other. And then I was just like, I'm, I'm good. I'm done. I, I'm, I'm on board. And it, the journey that you take us on in what could be said to be a relatively slim novel is intense and epic. And I think it's because Aikaya is coming to us from an ancient lineage. There's a way in which The Mermaid of Black Honk as a novel completely resists all Disneyfication. Like this is not Ariel the Mermaid. These scenes are not going to be shot with singing no, no, no. sea creatures. And there's a kind of urgency about showing a side of the Caribbean that certainly international readers are still having to reshape as being more than sun, sea, and sand. I mean, how, how important did it feel mm. to you to have Aikaia the mermaid be representative of a kind of fearsome female beauty that a lot of male writers resist writing about? Well, there's a lot there. So um, she's ancient, so mm -hmm. she's going to be um, indigenous. Um, all our ancient mermaids are indigenous. So the oldest mermaid story we have comes from Assyria from um, the Mesopotamian region and she was brown and she would have been indigenous. And so you're going back 3000 years. So you're going back before Christ, before our iconography, our Christian iconography. So the mermaid is an indigenous water goddess and she's everywhere. She's um, all across Asia, every ocean, lots of rivers. Um, we tend to gender nature feminine, you know, mother earth. Um, water is always seen as a feminine um, principle and element. So um, I, I feel terrible. I think the Dis Ariel, the Disney Little Mermaid is an abomination because Hans Christian Andersen's tale is equally grim. It's a terrible mm -hmm. story. It's a grim story about a mermaid who cuts out her tongue and agrees to be in terrible pain when she walks and she wants to get her man and the man doesn't, marry her in the end because she can't speak etc so um it's time we put disney in the kiddies cupboard you know and just put her away because what mermaids are is something so powerful and so ambiguous and so indigenous and uh that's what i i just sort of imagined what mermaids really must look like and who they are and there's so someone could come to this book and be completely ensorcelled by this mermaid. She alone and the way she's written on the page would be worth the price of admission entirely. But what I love is that David is such, I want to say novel, I want to say a new and, and radical way of writing male vulnerability, male sensitivity, not a perfect mm -hmm. man, like the novel never claims that he is, but the way that you reveal him to us in his love is there is room in it to be tender, to be afraid, to be full of doubt and uncertainty. I mean, how important did it feel for you to write, to write him in this way? Well, writing masculinity is a really big thing for me, whether it's Caribbean masculinity or any other masculinity, we need to be writing me new men. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say that's true of male writers as well. Um, but um, again, I'm talking about old myths. So when there's an old Taino myth, but there's also an old European myth in this book, which is the myth of Eros and Psyche, Cupid and Psyche. And that's a European story about um, a virgin or maiden woman who is initiated into erotic love and in in doing so to pass from maid to woman she has to surrender to eros and the story goes that you know she eros says you know i love you i love you darling but you must never look at me you must never look at me and of course one night she peeks a look at eros and then that's her undoing and so for me, again, being a feminist writer, I wanted to flip that myth 
because in these old stories, it's always the young woman who learns such. It was, it was the woman that has to learn the lesson. The woman has to surrender to Eros. The woman has to be taught this big lesson about sex. The woman, the woman, the woman's always a young girl has to learn something. So in this book, um, it's David is the one who has um, a relationship that changes him and changes him and makes him a better man. And so we have him narrating about this love affair and how meeting such an extraordinary and different woman um, changed him. And, and so we have Eros, because he is the lover. He is lover man, you know. He gives the mermaid her rite of passage, but it's really about how this completely innocent woman, how he surrendered to her. Mm -hmm. So we have male vulnerability, yeah. And it's, it's extraordinary to witness in, in a genre of writing that still heavily promotes the idea of male heroism and of saving vulnerable, mythical, female mm. gendered creatures. I mean, this book yeah. is, is confronting that head on. I mean, I think of The Mermaid of Black Honk, in fact, as a multi-genre book. It is, on its face, a novel. No one can deny that. But when Aikaya speaks to us, she speaks to us in verse. Her, her sharings mm -hmm. in the form of, of poem songs are so lyrical and so moving. We get to feel her complete fear, terror, and rage that feel transmuted through the form that you chose to have her speak in? Did you always have a sense that she was going to be talking to us this way in, in the novel? Well, um, that was one of the big challenges of the book. So originally I thought I'm gonna write the whole book from the point of view of the My Mermaid, who has to remember language. And then I thought, God, that's gonna be really, I mean, my friend, Anthony Joseph talked me out of it and said that's even I wouldn't do that. He's a great experimentalist. So I knew I wanted her voice in there, but I, I, I just kept, and I'm not really a poet. I'm a bit of a failed poet. Um, no, don't say that. Well, we'll, see, well you know, it, it's, always been, it's always been a secret fetish of mine, poetry. It's like the thing, it's unrequited love affair. You know, I love poetry, poetry doesn't love me. Can't write, I can't write poetry for Toffee, but I wanted her to speak and she has, so the acquisition of language is quite a big thing in the book. So she learns sign language, she learns parlance, she learns the Creole dialect, and she also learns standard English. So, and then she remembers, she starts to remember her language. So when she's speaking, um, I wanted it to, I wanted a flavor of all of that coming mm -hmm. through, that she's got a strange way of speaking <laughs> and a strange lexicon, but at the same time, she's being taught things like son of a bitch and, you know, wajang and, you know, pomsite and he, she's learning Caribbean words, but she's just learning everything in this kind of Caribbean way, this fusion thing is happening to her. Yeah, and I, I also wanted to um, write um, somebody who had like a shamanic consciousness Mm -hmm. So somebody who's just completely different, who doesn't have a modern persona, who just is like an ital, like an extreme rasta, who like, who, who sort of like greets a tree and, a tree, you know, can speak to the, you know, literally has a, a way of reading the world that is very, like, complicit with nature. And I just hope for me, if I pull that off, then I'd feel like, yeah, okay. Yes, my, my very brief and enthusiastic answer to that is absolutely. I mean, the interchanges we have with Aikaya and everyone else around her are this direct and immediate visceral confrontation of the contemporary with the very ancient, the very old. There's so much weight to this mermaid. You know, she is not ever just emblematic or symbolic of things or a long extended metaphor for femininity. She's those things too, but she is so vital to every part of the novel in a way that feels that it really honors 
femininity. It honors the evolution of female resistance and of struggle and of magic. Yeah, I, I thank you. You know, she is a, she, I wanted her to inspire awe in mm -hmm. the people who help her. Um, like she does with life and Reggie and David, like she has a small little group of friends who try to help her. And like Reggie and her are complete, uh, completely other and um, excluded from society, yet they bond, inst they bond instantly. And um, yeah, I just wanted her to be this sort of awesome person, this magical, not too magical. I didn't want her to be like, you know, the magical, the magical woman, the magical Negro, the magical kind of something that's uh, too, too, you know, in some way tropey. I just wanted her, to, I, you know, when you write a piece of fiction, you know, you're, you're imagining, you're using your basic tools of imagination. And um, I mean, I had such a good time writing this book. It's like, oh God, Aikaiya is one of the best things I've ever done with my life is make this, make this mermaid come to life. It is bright and ancient. And another book that really inspired me was um, William Golding's novel, The Inheritors, which is written from the point of view of a Neanderthal man who's sort of pre-verbal, has some telepathy. And that book really lit the way for me to get hold of this woman and, and write, write her down. Yeah. Books it's, make um, other books. Yeah, it's always exciting in, in bios and bookmarks when other writers readily and generously share the other books that they've been moved by. I find that yeah. so many writers play that way too close to the chest. It's almost as if it's a trade secret, but it's, it's fascinating to see the books that make other books. I mean, I think that's an excellent segue to, to bring in uh, one of my favorite projects that the NGC Book of Slit Fest has been working on, which you know about Monique, which is called the 100 mm. Caribbean Books That Made Us, where mm. we asked a question about which Caribbean books have fundamentally shaped your life as, as a reader, as a writer. And I want to extend that question to you. Which books mm. now, absolutely you would say, I would take these books with me if I knew the world was going to end because they have helped make Monique. <coughs> well, I've, I've talked about this book before, but I, um, so No Pain Like This Body by Sunny Ladu. I think it's the best Caribbean novel ever written. I think it's the best Trinidadian novel ever written. And I, I love it. You know, I just love the poetry of this novel, the story of this novel, the courage it took to write this novel. It's a beautiful piece of work. I would take that away with me. Um, then there's a whole bunch of books by um, the generation above me, written by Earl Lovelace. Um, I've always loved Salt. Um, I've always loved a couple, one, I'm not a big fan of V.S. Naipaul, but Gorillas, Gorillas is um, a masterpiece. Despite its misogyny, it's a masterpiece. Um, the poetry of Loretta Collins Clover. Um, and I, your good self. I mean, I think Shivani, you're one of our, you're going to be very famous and you're one of our you're one of our best poets, you know, you really are. Um, Dion Brand, Vani Capaldeo. I mean, like, for me, there's a, tr there's a, tr there's a holy trinity of uh, Trinidadian women writers, and they are Dion Brand, Vani Capaldeo, and you. I just think you're, oh my God. you're our trinity. And, you know, and I am, you know, the, I just think there's women writing currently in the Caribbean, just wiping the wiping it wiping things away in their path so i couldn't stop i mean i'm a big fan of the magical realists um garcia marquez isabella yende juan rufo um yeah just tons of you know it's all becomes a big mixture doesn't it if you read from the region it just becomes it just becomes a big big ocean of, of language and literature I love that you mentioned Garcia Marquez because while we've been chatting, the comment section on Facebook has been 
loving the mermaid and swimming alongside her. And we have quite a few comments I want to share with you. Ooh. And since we started with, since you mentioned Garcia Marquez, we have Shiva Gayadin, who oh. says, <laughs> Gabriel <laughs> Garcia Marquez was the master of magical realism. The current master is in this panel, and her name is Monique, and she's the <laughs> standard of that art. So that's very Hello. lovely. We have another comment from John Robert Lee, who tells us, not only great, fabulous, magical realism literature, but many deeply searched out love stories, searched out social historical rooted relationships, plantation capitalism confronted, and many other interweave themes woven Ooh. into a complete tapestry. Great page turner of a story. That of course is John Robert Lee, the prolific St. Lucian poet who has written his comment yeah. very much like a poem. Uh, a lovely comment here from Marsha Messiah of the Brooklyn Caribbean Lit Fest, who says, we love the commentary that Reggie provides about how the differently abled are managed in society, albeit buttressed by his mother's love. But the idea of separation for me was very symbolic. And maybe that's a good space for us to talk about how you worked in so deftly otherness and being on the fringes of society, even in a place, a small place like Black Conk, that felt like a very definite an intentional gesture of the novel to write the other. Yeah. God, where do I start? Well, the mermaid is a big other. She's an outsider, an outcast, an exile, exclusion. But Reggie, look, I have hearing loss. I have, I've had very bad hearing loss for about oh, a long time, a decade, if not longer. Um, it comes and goes. It's related to an autoimmune illness I have. And so I have been through periods of like not being able to hear quite badly, like severe, like seriously, you know, not being able to hear very well. So I always knew I was going to write a deaf character. I always knew that was coming. Um, so Reggie was born from my own understanding of what it's like to not be able to hear. Um, I had to do quite a bit of research for Reggie as well because I wanted to get it right. Um, about deaf people in the Caribbean and at the time in the 70s what kind of provision would have been for Reggie which is basically nothing mm -hmm. so if he was living in somewhere like Black Conk there would have been nothing there might have been more if he'd lived on the bigger island um, that he would have that you know Miss Rain would probably have um, hi had to hire a private tutor and that he would have understood and she would also know that she would lose him because she, of his deafness that he would eventually grow up to be a man want to seek community but at the same time I wanted to give Reggie um, pride pride in his otherness like he didn't want to wear a hearing aid he didn't doesn't you know he and he, he found deaf poetry found found poetry so Miss Rain had hired some kind of Californian hippie to teach him sign language and had introduced him to what deafness the deaf community so, so Reggie is like a, a community of one and he has deaf pride uh, in the same way you might have pride around being autistic or whatever it is, you know, he is, he is, he's him. He's not wearing a hearing aid, he's not having. And of course, you know, Priscilla, he's stigmatized, he's not deaf, he's, you know, he's not dumb, he's deaf, et cetera, et cetera. So, so him and him, he's, and the mermaid is his first friend. He makes a friend in the mermaid. Um, Reggie comes of age. He's only 10. He meets his dad. I mean, Reggie's at the center of the novel. Mm -hmm. Little boy, little deaf boy, you know, he gets his father back. He makes a friend. He gets his heart broken. So for me, it's, this is a love story. There's multiple love affairs happening in the book. Absolutely. It's not mm. just love for the primary and expected relationship. But it's the mermaid of Black Conk is showing us how love and also danger moves through everyone in this small community. And of course, I'm thinking of the relationship between Miss Rain and life as much as I am of Aikaia and David. The idea that a great love can be beset upon from so many sides, from history, from the patriarchy, mm. from the long, long line of colonialism. It's almost mm. as if the, the novel is asking us to contemplate how much danger can love be put through 
in order to survive. And I won't spoil the ending for those of those of us who haven't read it yet. And if you haven't, you clearly need to. I think that's the conclusion you should be coming to. But did your thoughts on this change or evolve? Or how did it feel to be putting love with such vulnerability on the page, exposing so much of what it means to give your heart in so many different ways? Well, you see, the, the love affair between Arcadia and life, again, oh, I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm a white woman. I mean, and I understand uh, lo what loving a black man is going gonna, is gonna to bring me um, in the region, you know, what, what that could look like, especially in the 70s, in a small place. Mm -hmm amplify that she's a she's a um landowner mm -hmm. um benevolent landowner trying to get rid of she's i wanted to I, I look i for a start i there's a big famous white woman in our literature antoinette causeway who much respected jean reese she's a bit of a freudian hysteric she's a bit of a she's a bit of a like, you know, mad takes a mad woman to write a mad woman or something mm -hmm. like that. But I'm a little bit done with her. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, it's time we look at different types of whiteness. And um, I wanted a white character to be caught up in this dangerous drama mm -hmm. and to be also cursed with history. She says to life, there's a big love scene where they argue and yes. he hurls at her that wrecking ball and she catches it just and just wants to put it aside because they fell in love when they were young, when they were children. So this is a long, this is an innocent love story that turns adult, it turns difficult and dangerous when they both grow up. And then the economic and historic structure and power structure starts to pop into life for both of them. And then, then they can't love each other anymore. And this is just such a tragedy. It and, is. Um, it's a tragedy. And, and to write that scene where he comes at her and says, you know, I don't want to, you know, I've, mm -hmm. you know, you own everything. I've had enough. I can't live here. What do you want me to do? And, but what he doesn't realize is the power he has, which is she loves him and he loves her. It's, it's actually been a bigger thing. The love they have, again, you know, violins, you know, but the love they have has, He's completely underestimated the power he has over her and the stakes, the stakes he has in her life and that and that she's caught up in this, too. And they have this standoff where they said, look, we can do better than this because, OK, I, you win. I'm bad. <clears throat> Is this where we get to again and again? History or love, history or love, you know, and. Um, and I think it's just for me, it was one of the bravest things I've ever, I've ever written this complete confrontation where, you know, I think she puts her panties on and walks off and says, let's mm -hmm. have breakfast because you're just leaving that conversation again and again. And um, I know it too well, you know. I mean, that the, the strength of not avoiding those narratives in the novel is undeniable. There's a way in which the Mermaid of Black Conk as, as a narrative entity is making room to look at and regard different facets of whiteness. There is a way in which Miss Rain is white, yes, but she is integrally a part of Black Conk, of its, of its people, of its topography, of its changeability, and the way in which it can be both a brutal and a beautiful place. And people like the Claysons have no reckoning with that. You're then showing a completely different facet and armature of whiteness that is threatening and, and contemporary for that time. It, to me, one of the things that the novel does best is balance that gaze and show that they're not at all the same thing and they could never be. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I know lots of people like Miss Rain, you know, they're white, white Caribbean people. And they're, they're not going nowhere. They're part of the drama. They are part, they're completely caught up in the, in, in, in the story of the region. And they have, 
brown children and they have black lovers and they have white friends and they are cursed by history and and they're not such terrible people and they're not mad they're not mad and they you know and I, I won't call any names but I know all kinds of people who live <laughs> similar similar lifestyle to Miss Rain and mm -hmm. and um they're part of things you know they they and they they live with their own um history the history of who of who their ancestors were and you know why have they got all this land and you know what are we going to do um these people are part of our storytelling and she she's very much part of the drama and um you know she's she's overlooked the uh, white men don't want to speak to her who is this woman she's mm -hmm. got the same creole language she's abrupt she's not european she's not english they can't make her out and that is a very common um, experience for Caribbean white people. You leave the Caribbean and everybody, nobody knows what to make of you. <clears throat> and, um, and they don't want to speak to her. She's not the boss, but she is the boss. And of course she's related to everybody and everybody's related to her. Um, she's not the same as the Claysons. The Claysons are completely lost. They are completely not, they read the room badly. They read the whole island badly. They get badly fucked over like many white people who come to the Caribbean and uh, and have, you know, they come on holiday or they come to do something like take, 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 take. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, lots of, ultimately she's, I, I wanted to write a complex character that people might even like who happen to be white. Like is, is an understatement. And I think for every character in the novel, including the people, one might identify as villainous. There's still nuance in the Claysons, for example, in the complexity of that father-son relationship, in the ways that the son has come in a very colonizing mode, but also has deep secrets within himself that he has to reckon Ooh. with. There is nuance in every character, no matter how vile their intentions and that is very moving i think the son's a queer character straightforward mm -hmm. he's like yeah dad maybe i do like men you know i've come back to save the mermaid from your crazy mad ass <laughs> i just i just think um i just wanted uh, the, the caribbean i know and i know the caribbean you know because it's in your work as well is so um, excitingly complicated mm -hmm. you know how many people do you and I both know who are about 10 different types of um, uh, racial mix you know you see these mixed up Creole people who you don't know you know they're like five or six you know, they're Indian they're Chinese they're white they're brown they're black they're numerous permutations and and I definitely think that uh, I don't want to be reading or writing books that has everybody like in a box, like this is what Afro-Caribbean people, that's their thing. And then this is this person's thing. Not the, not the, not the world I, that I live in or understand when I, when, I live, when I live in Trinidad, it's like people are really complicated because of our history. You know, people are racially really, really richly mixed up. I mean, generally. I never thought- I, That's what I- Sorry, yes. I, I never thought I'd hear myself say something like this, but I, you know, I'm happy to say it for all of us to hear is that, as, as you well know, the White Sargasso Sea is one of my favorite, favorite is hardly the word, it's, it is a book of the Caribbean to me. But I think, and I never thought I would get to a place where I thought we need more than Antoinette Causeway. We need more than oh, yeah. that depiction. But I, you yeah. know, in speaking with you and in reading this book, I feel that if there is to be a space that's carved out for more, then I want to read your books about it. Thank you. Yeah. And Thank I think- I, I mean, I feel the same way about, about Jean Reese. I feel the same way about her. I love her. And I feel, I feel a sort of lineage that she's, she's given us as a female writer, she's given us something. And mm -hmm. I, I love that book too, you know, but there's, I, if somebody talks about another white mad woman, mm -hmm. a Caribbean, my, I would just sort of scream. I've had enough of her as well. And it's, it's, I'm done. She's, 
you know, yeah. And, and, and you know, being mad and female isn't okay. Um, <laughs> this is something that, you know, the Freud used to sort of treat, treat women who were hysterical and a bit mad. And so we have, to, we have to also look at, you know, there's so much more to write about. Um, yes, I think with, there is with the this subject. book, we're fully out of the attic, I think is what you're showing us. We're out of that, we're out of Thornfield and we are on to other stories about white Caribbean womanhood and womanhood in the Caribbean, which is what the Mermaid of Black Honk is about. I think actually this is a good time for us to move into your second reading, if you wouldn't mind. Ah, okay. All right. I just wanted to say something about mental health in the region as well. No one's writing about that, are they? Please send me your, I, I don't, yeah, madness is interesting in itself. Mad women? Anyway, so, um, so basically, um, oh God, okay. All right, so uh, Aikaya has been rescued by David. He takes her home, hoping to uh, put her back in the sea like the next day, but she starts to kind of fall apart. Everything falls off really quickly. And he's basically now got a woman, an ancient Taino woman, can't speak uh, anything that she can remember living in his house. And Miss Rain comes to see him because Miss Rain um, was in love with his uncle life. So, and she brings Reggie with him and um, so I'll just read a bit from when Miss Rain meets the mermaid for the first time. When Arcadia and Reggie Rain knocked on David's door, they waited. Aikaia had time to hide upstairs, but David was close to despair. By then he'd shared his home with an ex-mermaid for nearly four weeks. He was smitten, but she was messy. She was slovenly in fact. She, in fact, she'd not only ejected him from his own bedroom, but littered it with half-eaten mango skins and fruit skins. He had to empty her pail every day, and while it had been hard at first to get her to wear clothes, when she finally accepted them, it was hard to convince her to change them. She inspired awe, but she smelled bad. She sang in bed every night, and he'd begun to fear his neighbors would hear and get nosy. Slowly, slowly, all the walking practice had paid off. She could stand without the frame. Soon she would be walking, and then what? Where would she go? And how could he begin to explain her existence to his neighbors, let alone the village? He'd gotten used to the way she looked, but he wasn't sure if she really passed as human. It was her eyes mostly. They were too bright. Hello, shouted Arcadia. David opened the door. Hello, Miss Rain, he whispered. She glared at him. David, what the hell happened to you? David was taken aback. Apart from Priscilla and the ex-mermaid, he'd seen nobody for weeks. How do you mean? You look like shit. This place stink, what happened? Nothing. Miss Rain shipsed and rolled her eyes and walked in and walked in. Reggie followed her. He was wearing a burning spear t-shirt and mirrored sunglasses. He looked like he was in a reggae band already. He bounced fists with David. Serious man, Arcadia said, what happened? She drew up one of the two white plastic chairs and looked around. It smells funny in here and your pirog is gonna sink soon if you don't go and empty it. What is going on? I've been quiet, miss. That's it, minding my own business, doing my chores. Reggie was looking around for objects to make things with. It made David nervous. Let me fix you some tea, David said. Okay. Anyway, I came for a reason, said Miss Rain. David filled the kettle with water and struck a match for the gas burner and held it till a violet flower danced. I came to ask you about your uncle. Oh, uh -huh, which one? Don't give me that. You know damn well which one. He turned around and he saw she was actually blushing, which he'd never seen before. Miss Rain wasn't the blushy type. She looked young, more like 30, though she was 10 years older than that. Her life was well known, but also mysterious. She kept to herself, but everyone knew what had happened. She get horn real bad. 
His uncle life was a sweet man and a horner man, well and true. Reggie had a half brother in Black Conch for sure, but no one yet had put two and two together and knew who they were. It's Reggie's, Reggie's 10th birthday soon, she began. David nodded. I figure he deserves a party or something. I've been thinking about it. David nodded again, but he was also watching Reggie. I figure we could invite a few people around, maybe, you know, like Cece and maybe you and, you know. I even, I even wonder if the kettle shrilled. He took it off, off the hob with a mitt. Gosh, no man. You know what I mean? No, miss. She looked at him straight. And his, her eyes were a little wet. You've never heard from your uncle life? He looked at her, wishing it were different. She wasn't a bad woman, but she was way too good for his uncle life. He left her good and proper for a sexy, high-class town brown woman in Port Isabella. That much he didn't know. But he would never say such a thing to her. She didn't need to know that. No, miss, I've never heard from him or my father. No one's heard from either of them for a long time. They're in Port Isabella. Nothing? No, it was a small lie. He'd heard life had had an exhibition not too long ago that he'd started hanging out with the arty crowd in town. He wasn't too interested in life for his father, to be honest. Miss Rain, he said, look, life is not coming back anytime soon. Okay, I reckon. She nodded. Yeah, I figure that too. I just want Reggie. And they both looked towards where Reggie had been standing, but he was gone. A shriek erupted from upstairs. David froze. What the hell was that? said Miss Rain. David quailed and closed his eyes. Oh Lord, what is that child doing up there? Arcadia leapt up and ran up the stairs. David stayed downstairs helpless. At least it was Miss Rain. David! David, come up here now! Arcadia was sitting up in Arcadia was sitting up in bed in his dirty jersey and track pants and her matted dreads and her eyes shining like bright stars. Kneeling close to her was Reggie and he was signing to her and she was nodding and trying to copy him. Miss Rain was watching them. David came up and saw the mermaid and David came up and he saw the mermaid and Reggie busy with their hands and Miss Rain's wonderment. Who the hell is she? Asked Miss Rain. I can explain. David, she don't look normal. David bit his mouth and nodded. She has strange hands. Who is she? She's a mermaid, miss. Miss Rain turned to look at him. What? She is the mermaid them white men catch three or four weeks ago. David, please don't tell me this. She put her hands over her ears. Miss, it's true, I cut her down. I rescue her, it's me who teeth her. Arcadia stared at her son, who was giving the mermaid his, who was, and he was giving the mermaid his own language. David, no. Yes, miss. She shook her head and tears welled. Them damn stupid Yankee men came up to tell me all about it. And one almost got his head bust by a peacock. No! David nodded, yes. Arcadia stared hard, shit man, David. Tears fell down David's face, hot and salty. He was relieved, he had been scared, not to say tired. He hadn't slept well all these last few weeks, it all welled up. What in Frigg's name happened to her? A tail fell off. I can see that. Yes, it all fell off. She started to come back almost at once. Oh, Miss Rain said, shaking her head. I figure I was gonna take her back as a fish and put you back into the sea and said she started to come back. Oh my word, but she's only now she's learning to walk. Oh, I, I love her, Miss Arcadia Gar. It happened instant, shit. They both stared in awe at the mermaid and the child sitting on the bed making hand signs. Thank you. 
Wow, thank you, Monique. <laughs> I think um, just looking at the comments in, in the Facebook live chat, people were mesmerized. Marsha Messiah literally typed out O Bacchanal in Kerwin Dubois <laughs> voice. We have June Amming commenting, saying, loving this, enjoying this great reading. And a lovely comment from the Dominican writer Celia Soando, who says, yes, re the madness that we were discussing. I was about to say I'm okay to be in the attic and basement for a time, as long as I'm not forced there and not locked there. The door left wide, wide open. And I think that is a beautiful summation of what, yeah. what Mermaid of Black Honk is doing. It's blasting open the door and saying, you can write about madness if you want to, but just know that there is a world of writing outside of this and other incarnations mm. of this. And now the mm. great reclamation is in our hands, i.e. the hands of yep. Caribbean women writers. Yeah, many women, many, many different types of women. I mean, we can't let Monique yeah. go without <laughs> playing our game, read, write, avoid. So for those of you who don't know what it's about, the premise is simple, but we hope also fun. We present each of our bios and bookmarks guests with a scenario that is meant to be a little bit playful and ask them if they would rather read about it, written by someone else, write about it themselves, or avoid the whole damn thing altogether. So, Monique, today's scenario for you is called Monique the Mermaid's Manifesto, a one woman Broadway play telling your entire life in writing told 100% in the nude. Would you rather read, write, or avoid it? Um, I think, I think that's between, I think that's a toss up between watching somebody else do this writing about me and avoiding it completely. Yeah, no, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's to be avoided. Mm -hmm. I think that's an avoid one. Yeah. Yeah, it, it seems like the sort of thing that would be wonderful for everyone else but you to experience. About me, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I have done, I have written a rather racy memoir. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of, um, and what this, this uh, that's another, that's another session, isn't it? That's another story. <laughs> but I wouldn't, I wouldn't really, when I read my memoir now, which I wrote about 10 years ago, part of me goes, oh, you know, my God, what was I thinking? Jesus Christ, you know, I mean, part of me is just like, oh, would I write this, that now? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely not. Am I really proud of it? Yes. And I, it's, and it's probably the book that when I'm in, on my deathbed, it's the only book that's really, um, you know, novels are novels and it's great that people like The Mermaid and any other book that I've written, but a memoir can help people. A memoir my memoir has the kind of letters I've had back from my memoir. Why am I talking about my memoir? I, I wouldn't mind people talk, writing about my intimate, my, my life, um, but I think I've already done it. I've already stood naked in front of people. I think I have stood naked um, in the world. And, and for those of you who don't know the memoir, it's yeah. called And With the Kisses of His Mouth. And it, I think that the time that I read this memoir, Monique, you and I didn't know each other very well, if at all. And the thing that struck me then about your writing is in many ways, it's almost as if it's come in a kind of full circle. The thing that strikes me about The Mermaid of Black Conk is it's utterly, completely defiant to the idea of taboo, the idea that there are things in our society that we've been told we're not to write about. And you can almost guarantee that a Monique Rafi book in any genre is going to confront that radically and outrageously. Mm. And that's a gift. Mm. And thank you for that. Well, I just want to share a memory that I have with you. Um, and it was a couple of years ago. I know the time's running out, but we did a reading together once, didn't we? Do you remember? And, yes. um, and it was just like blow the roof off. Um, between your poems and my, I think I read from the Trist. That's right. Um, and it was, um, it's the most, it's really sexually explicit um, novella. And 
it's just great, isn't it? It's just so great when you can just you can just rip up the rule books and just go, I'm doing this anyway. This is my job, you know, I don't care. And you and I did this amazing reading, and I will, it's one of the, my most, it's one of a highlight of my career reading with you, reading, you know, you reading your poems and me reading from the tryst. So I think we share that. I think we share a sort of like fearlessness and um, a kind of radical fearlessness in the face of everything that is difficult out there. The male gaze, um, everybody else. I mean, you know, the two, it, there's just, yeah, I, I think we share that. Thank you for that, Monique. I, I remember that reading very, very well as well. And it's thinking about the writers who I think of as doing dangerous and necessary work feels all the more necessary in times like these, like in the past week that the Trinidad has had, for example. We haven't touched yeah. directly on that, but we've been talking about how unspeakable violence against women shapes our mm -hmm. society and not for the better. Mm -hmm. And I think books like Mermaid act directly as a counter narrative to that violence. They absolutely do. Yeah, I think that's something that, we, that writers need to take seriously, which is, um, which is this, you know, cultural misogyny, chauvinism, it's got to go. We need men, we need men, we need male writers, we need male partners, we need partners. I, I was just watching Gabrielle Hossein doing a live piece to camera. I think she probably filmed it a couple of days ago. And like, I've been following her for like a decade. She don't think she does that very often where she just right, puts the camera on and says, look, mm -hmm. I'm almost done. What are we going to do? But I remember getting involved with the murder of Asami Nagakia which was about five years ago, murderer never caught. A few months later, some woman was found in a freezer down in Port of Spain, murder Shannon never Banfield. caught. Yeah, yeah. And then this keeps happening and we have 500 murders a year, but at least a hundred of them are women um, who vanish, they disappear, never found, you know, a missing woman is a dead woman. It's just shocking and, you know, yeah writing needs to confront this absolutely all writers male writers need to confront what's going on yeah i think yes i think for andrea barrett for ashanti riley and for the countless women stretched across mm. trinidadian and caribbean history if writers mm. have it within them or even if they think they don't to confront it mm. there's never yeah. been a better time to do that than now and for those of you who may feel at a loss about what to do with recent events in Caribbean society. I would recommend turning to Monique's books. I mean, even in the comments, we have Guyane Wilson saying, but The Mermaid has helped her and Archipelago as well. And that's a testament to the power of fiction. Fantastic, to, thank you. To help thank save you. us. And I think that's a beautiful note on which to end. I wanna thank you so much, Monique, for this incredible sharing. Thank you for reading and giving of yourself so generously. Ooh, pleasure. I, I get to talk to you. So the pleasure is mine. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. And um, let's meet again. And we're all the world is waiting for your next collection of poetry. Oh, thank Giovanni. you, Monique. Thank you. Um, for those of you who have not read The Mermaid of Black Conk and now after this conversation need to, right? You can get it directly from the publisher, People Tree Press. Shout out to People Tree Press for all that they do for Caribbean Ooh. writers all over the world. And Monique, yeah. again, congratulations to you. This has been another Thank episode of, of Bios and Bookmarks powered by the NGC Focus Lit Fest. You'll see us again here at the same time next Sunday. Till then, please be safe and take care. Thank you.